Welcome, I am your host, and this is the Unanswered Questions Podcast. Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of my new podcast, Unanswered Questions, where every week we will endeavour to discuss a mysterious unsolved case that has many lingering unanswered questions. So I hope you enjoy, and as always, leave me some feedback on what you think about the show, and rate it as well. Now on to the show. This week we'll be talking about the 3X murders. So on June 11th of 1930, Joseph Mozinski and Catherine May were sitting together in a parked car in Whitestone, Queens, New York. As reported by an article on Angel Fire, May said a man approached the vehicle, shot Mozinski dead, and there is conflicting statements stating that the mystery man raped May, but that remains unverified. The assailant gave the girl a 3 by 7 inch slip of paper with strict orders that she was not to read the note until the next day. He then escorted her to a bus and sent her home. As reported by Wattpad, May did not immediately report the murder. Instead, she waited until authorities contacted her about the bloodstained coat she left on Monzinski's car. When confronted, May gave police the note she received from the shooter. The note simply said, and I quote, Joseph Monzinski 3X 3X 097. End quote. The police questioned Miss May, and after three days, they retained her under $50,000 bail, which was later reduced to $5,000, as a material witness due to the conflicting accounts she gave them, including the implication of the Italian gangster Albert Lombardo, whom the police believed to be non-existent. Later, the girl reportedly admitted that her story was untrue. Mazinski's death received no special treatment until Noel Soley, a young radio mechanic from Brooklyn, was found dead in his coop on a secluded road in nearby Creedmoor shot twice in the left temple. Like Mozinski, Soli was accompanied by a young woman, a Miss Bitty Ring, at the time of his death. According to her report to the police, a lanky man with a thin face and sunken cheeks leveled a pistol at Soli and, in a German accent, demanded his driver's license. After glancing over it, the man told Soli, and I quote, You're the one we want, all right, and you're going to get what Joe got, end quote. He fired twice and Soli slumped over the wheel. The killer then searched Soli's pockets, but Miss Ring was unable to tell whether he took anything. The lanky man gave Miss Ring a slip of paper similar to that given to Miss May and escorted her home on a bus. Betty Ring's description of the murder matched Catherine May's description of Mazinski's assailant, but the key clue that linked the two deaths was a newspaper clipping that the police found in Soli's pocket. The clipping told of Mazinski's death, and someone had penciled the phrase, and I quote, Here's how, end quote, on the margin. Later, the police suspicions were confirmed when ballistics tests showed that the bullets used to kill Joseph Mazinski and Noel Snowley were shot from the same gun. Immediately, the police began what was to be a 19-day search for the killer, involving 2,000 uniformed patrolmen and 425 specialized units. Patrolmen were then sent to guard secluded roads and favorite parking spots for young couples, and others combed the area looking for the killer, who they believed, because of the close proximity of the State Hospital for the Insane at Creedmoor, was a lunatic. The deaths of Joseph Mazinski and Noel Snowley were also linked to a series of strange warning notes which were sent to a variety of people, including the New York Police Department and the New York Evening Journal. These notes, which frequently mentioned international papers, foretold of Snowley's murder and warned that another body would be found in Queens and that 13 more men and women would be murdered. The notes were all signed with the cryptic signature of an inverted V, followed by the notion V3X. Three days after Sally was murdered, traces of the killer 3X appeared in Pennsylvania. A letter written in handwriting identical to that in earlier notes was delivered to Joseph Mazinski's brother John, who was living in Philadelphia. The note ordered Mazinski's brother to surrender certain documents by placing them in a newspaper and leaving it by the back entrance to the men's room at Broad Beach Station on Saturday afternoon. If he did not have the papers, then he was to leave word who had. The note went on to threaten that if the papers were not surrendered, John Mazinski, as well as two others from Philadelphia, would pay for it with their lives. Like the others, the letter was signed with an inverted V, followed by V3X. Meanwhile, the $10,000 a day manhunt continued. Every day, police brought in suspect after suspect for Catherine May and Betty Ring to examine, only to be told that each suspect was not the man they were looking for. Police continued to control the area, postal workers were given orders to be on the lookout for suspicious characters, yet still, 3X remained at large. Finally, on June 21, the police received a letter from 3X in which he stated that his mission had ended. The letter did much to fill in the gaps concerning the person of 3X, his motives, and his connection with Mazinski and Sowley. 
According to the letter, 3X was a former officer in the German army who had become a special agent of the Red Diamond of Russia, an international secret society located across the world and composed of all nationalities. The inverted and upright Vs in the signature on the notes represented the organization. The subsequent notation 3X was apparently the author's code name. Noel Sowley and the Mazinski brothers had apparently once belonged to the Red Diamond but were discharged for treason after they turned against the League and became involved with a gang of blackmailers and drug smugglers. The letter went on to say that one of the men stole three documents, one military, one political, and one commercial, and was using these documents for the purposes of blackmailing the Red Diamond. After the incident was reported, the Supreme Council in Russia, 12 Red Diamond agents, randomly drew from a deck of cards. The author of the letter picked the King of Diamonds and was therefore selected to punish and to inflict death if necessary. End quote. Finally, the letter affirmed that the last of the documents had been surrendered, thereby ending the Agent 3X's mission. It purported that 3X was returning to Russia and that any further notes would not be authentic. Quote, it is settled, the author declared, end quote. The matter, however, was far from settled, though. The police appeared to be of the opinion that the letter was merely a cover and subsequently only increased their efforts. The search continued using every angle imaginable. Police searched for a man masquerading as a woman to hide his identity. They combed the area for a body with the idea that he might have committed suicide. They tried to trace the watermark of the slips of paper that were given to the murder victim's companions. Suspects were brought in to be inspected by Miss Ray and Miss Ring, but all were dismissed as having no connection with the murders. Some suspects looked so similar to the killer that it was only after some difficulty that the witnesses cleared them. Still... 3X went uncaptured. Letters claiming to be from the mysterious killer continued to be sent. Interestingly, all notes received after the June 21 final letter, in which 3X dismissed all further notes to be phony, were signed only with the notation 3X. The cryptic symbol representing the Red Diamond of Russia was not used. Various people also had their lives threatened. Queensborough President Harvey received a telephone call, supposedly from 3X, concerning government matters. Miss Edna Sanchez, Borough President Harvey's confidential secretary who took the call, told the caller to call back, after which she notified the police. Consequently, her life was also threatened. Over a week, threats continued. There were no more deaths connected to the slayings, however, but there was a letter that described the death of an insurance collector, but it was judged to be fake. The police believed that the note was written in an attempt to throw the authorities off the track of the victim's real murderer. Police vainly continued to search the area until the police commissioner finally voiced his opinion that the killer had told the truth when he stated in his letter that his mission was over. The 200 patrolmen that were left guarding Queen's Roads were, were withdrawn, but the police investigation continued. In late August of 1930, Aaron Blattman, a court fingerprints expert, was arrested for making anonymous phone calls to the police. During these calls, Blattman offered to divulge the name of Joseph Mazinski's murderer if the police would post a reward. After viewing both Blattman and a friend of his, Catherine May and Betty Ring, both agreed that neither man was the one who'd shot their companions. Blattman was held under $50,000 bail as a material witness, but he was later released on a right of habeas corpus. After the Blackman incident, the 3X case subsided for five and a half years with just a brief revival in June of 1931. This was because the police received a note purporting to be from 3X that described the death of an unknown individual and threatened a Pittsburgh girl between 18 and 25, end quote. In June of 1936, almost six years after the murder of Soli and Mazinski, 3X was suddenly thrust back into the public eye when police arrested a young man who confessed to be the puzzling slayer. When questioned, however, the man gave many conflicting accounts of the killings, which caused the district attorney to regard him as a mental case. In addition, Miss May and Miss Ring stated that he was definitely not the murderer of their companions, largely because of his age. I mean, upon seeing him, Miss Ring remarked, and I quote, The man you want was older in 1930 than this man is today, end quote. The man was released and committed to the state hospital for the insane at Creedmoor. The three X murders remain unsolved even today. The chief question that arises is who the killer really was. I mean, was three X the code name of an agent of a murderous underground society, or was it the pseudonym of a delusional maniac? Were all the letters authentic other than the ones proven to be fake? And if so, why did they contradict each other so much? Because the three X affair remains unsolved, there are many theories to consider.
You see, back in 1930, the general public, including the New York Police Department and the New York Times, seemed to regard 3X as a madman and the Red Diamond of Russia as the probably mythical group that he said dispatched him on his missions of death. This probably is the most realistic theory, especially considering the fact that the Creedmoor Asylum is located less than a mile from where Soli was shot, although no inmates were reported missing, but it is by no means the only plausible explanation. A minor but potentially important point to consider is Miss Catherine May's role in the 3X affair. Her initially conflicting reports to the police were never satisfactorily resolved, and no ulterior motive that she may have had was ever established. Due to the lack of information about Miss May, that is a point about which we can only speculate. By far the most appealing and possibly the most accurate theory is, in this case, the most fantastic, is that 3X was in actuality a secret agent sent by an illegal secret society to retrieve stolen documents from defectors. This theory has the flavour of the classic film noir genre and is not as preposterous as it might initially seem. According to 3X's final letter to the police, the Red Diamond of Russia did not recognise the Soviet Union as a legitimate nation. It is interesting to note that while the Red Diamond opposed the Soviet Union, it identified itself using the internationally recognised symbol of communism. There were many anti-communist groups in Russia during the early 1930s, and there is a possibility that the Red Diamond was one of these groups, later destroyed during Stalin's Great Purge. Several pieces of information suggest the validity of this theory, for example, the incongruity that characterizes this incident occurred briefly after June 21, when 3X declared his mission accomplished. Many 3X suspects and letters were proven false, illustrating the morbid fascination that people can have with the macabre, as well as their hunger for publicity. It is not unreasonable to assume that all letters subsequent to June 21st were forgeries. No deaths occurred after 3X supposedly retreated to Russia, despite the many threats that were issued. It may seem strange that a former German military officer would be involved in an anti-communist underground movement in Russia, but the existence of Al-Qaeda terrorist cells in non-Muslim countries such as, ironically, Germany, demonstrate the internationality of organised crime. As an unsolved murder, many questions concerning the 3X killings remain unanswered. 3X was never found, no one was ever able to prove if this red diamond of Russia ever existed, and we may never know the true story behind the so-called 3X killings. With that, this case remains open, but with many unanswered questions, it still remain unanswered. Please rate the show and let me know what you guys think about this and the many other cases I have covered. You can follow me on all major social media platforms, YouTube, BitChute, Dailymotion. I'm also on Twitter and Instagram. Links are all down below in the description. If you have a case you'd like me to look at or cover, don't hesitate to send me a message. I'm your host and this has been the Unanswered Questions podcast. Until next time. Next on Unanswered Questions. Christine Chris Chubak, born August 24th of 1944 and died on July 15th of 1974, was an American television news reporter who worked for stations WTOG and WXLT-TV in Sarasota, Florida. She was the first person to die by suicide on a live television broadcast. <laughs>